first of all, I'd like to, to, to thank uh, all the organizers, especially Ezequiel and Martin, for the invitation to be here. For me, it's a great honor. It's a big pleasure. My first time in Uruguay, and, and it's a great privilege to be here. <coughs> so, my main, my main interest in research is dynamical systems coming from uh, physics and geometry. And many of these systems are Hamiltonian in nature. They, they are, um, perhaps better said, they are uh, uh, examples of Hamiltonian systems. And among many topics that, uh, that interest me, one, the, perhaps the one that interests me most is the existence of global surfaces of section. So let me explain a bit what that is, and then I guess just from the definition to be clear, what are they good for? And actually, the, 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 these gadgets are, these objects are uh, uh, deeply connected to the, to the birth of many fields in, in mathematics, especially um, symplectic topology, dynamical systems. I, I'll, I'll try to explain as best as I can. And please interrupt me if, if anything is not clear, okay? I'm sorry for speaking in English because my Spanish is not uh, very good. So I have about uh, 45, 50 minutes. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Um, so what's a global surface section? So let's say we're interested in a, in a flow on a three manifold. Let's say you have a vector field, and this vector field generates a flow. So then one is interested in studying the, the, the dynamical properties of this system, okay? Um, right, so if you take a point P, then the system evolves in time, and then at a given time T, the point P is evolved to a point phi T of P. So for each T, you have a, a transformation of the phase space. Phase space is, is the name you give for the space, the three manifold where this system is defined, all right? And a global surface of section is a, an embedded embedded, compact, orientable surface inside the, the phase space, the three manifold M, with the following properties. So the boundary of the surface consists of periodic orbits. The flow, the vector field generating the flow, or let's say the flow, so the vector field generating the flow is transverse to the interior. Of course, it's not transverse to the boundary, because the boundary, in the boundary, it's tangent to the boundary, right? periodic orbits. And three, so for every point P not in the boundary, there are, there are positive times such that if a flow P by some positive time T plus, I end up in S. And if I flow P by minus some positive time, or let's say by some negative time, you end up in S. 
Right, so this means that uh, you have this embedded surface. Have some periodic orbits here. And then the flow, uh, uh, so for every point, you're gonna flow and then eventually you're gonna come back to the surface itself. Or if you go negative time, you're going to hit the surface again. Okay. So every single trajectory, which is not one of these periodic orbits, will hit this surface infinitely many often in the future in the past, which means that you can, you can define a first return time for every point. So if, if you consider points in the surface out of the, out of the boundary, you have a first return time. And with this first return time, you all can also define a first return map. And then this, this two-dimensional diffeomorphism encodes the whole dynamics of the three-dimensional flow. Right? So you can reduce the, the study of the dynamics of three-dimensional flow to the dynamics of the return map. So you can, and then this is, a big, uh, this is a big achievement if you find a, an object like this, because two-dimensional dynamics is much more well-developed than, than, than the three-dimensional dynamics. So we have much more. So Reduce to, so reduces the study of the flow on M to the study of the return map back to the interior. Right, so you have a Given a point P, let's say P point in the surface not in the boundary, then you have a, a first return time. And you have a first return map. So this diffeomorphism psi captures all the dynamics. Okay. Uh, let me give a f let, let me draw a bunch of examples, a few examples at least. So, of course, you can consider suspension flows, right? If you have, of course, if you have a diffeomorphism of a surface. Let's see an open surface. You, you can cook up some. You know, if, if the diffeomorphism is not so well, not so badly behaved near the boundary of the surface, you can consider the mapping torus. You can consider the flow, which gives this, uh, um, which is the suspension of this diffeomorphism. And if the diffeomorphism is not so bad near the boundary, you can sort of close it up and get a, a global surface section, some three-dimensional manifold. But that example was artificially constructed. Um, So let me, let, me draw, let me now discuss some examples which are not so artificially constructed. So as I said before, my interest in, is in Hamiltonian dynamics. Just to recall, uh, if you have some Hamiltonian, let's say in standard to n dimensional phase space, what do I mean by that? I mean, just, just a function on an open set of R2n. Then you can consider the Hamilton's equations. Let's say. Even by this set of differential equations. And it's a feature. So this is a special kind of flow. And it's a feature of these types of flow that the flow preserves the levels of the function h. So if you consider, so if you start considering functions on R4 or open sets of R4, the, the level sets will be giving you examples of three manifolds with equipped flows. So one particular example is uh, 
if you take, if, let's, say, let's say you consider two uncoupled harmonic oscillators with the same period, right? So, let me write it like that. So let's say the, the round three sphere in the round three sphere in R4 is an energy level of this Hamiltonian. And the every single periodic orbit is periodic, every single orbit is periodic, and the, fi the, the orbits of this flow are the so-called hop vibration. Right? So every, every orbit, so the flow is looking like that. Let's say, let's say, uh, yeah, you start in some point. Let me let me identify. Let me write it as complex coordinates. So the flow is really looking like. This formula. So you see that every, every, sorry, every single trajectory is periodic, the period is pi. And a global surface of section here is just given by, uh, if you choose any any complex subspace, any complex plane which doesn't go through the origin, let's say choose a complex plane here. And if you project it radially onto the sphere, just like that, you're going to end up with a disk whose boundary, of course this picture is bad because it's, this is not a two-dimensional situation, anyway. but you're going to end up with a, uh, uh, with a disk whose boundary is one of the hop circles. And every single trajectory is going to hit this. I mean, it's going to be a global surface section like, just like that, disk-like global surface section. Of course, the dynamics here is, here is very simple. The, the, the return time, the return map is, the return time is just constant function equal to pi. Return map is just the identity map. There's nothing much going on. That's, that's an example. Maybe the easiest, the easiest one. So here's another example. If you consider, let's say if you consider a positively curved a sphere of revolution inside R3, right? You have uh, some symmetry axis here. It's not very symmetric, but right. Right. So you have uh, some graph, some convex graph like that, and you rotate it around the, an axis. And you consider the, consider the geodesic flow on the surface. And you consider the geodesic flow on the unit sphere bundle. So the, the phase space is now the unit sphere bundle, which is just SO3 or RP3. The flow is still integrable. I mean, still an integrable Hamiltonian system, just like this one. And the, the, integ the integral is the Clairaut integral. And using the Clairaut integral, you, you find that so when, when their sphere here is getting fatter, you, you, you end up with a closed geodesic, which is, which is this, this equator. And you can consider the Birkhoff annulus over this simple geodesic, which is this equator, which is the set of vectors in the unit sphere bundle, so a set of unit vectors, pointing, say, to the northern hemisphere. So at every point here, you have this bouquet of, of, of unit vectors pointing north. And then, so this, this is an embedded annulus inside the unit sphere bundle, whose boundary consists of two closed geodesics, right? This simple geodesic going that way, and this other one going that way. The flow is transverse. And because of this integrability, you know that every trajectory is going to go down and then have to go up again. So trajectories are going to flip north and, and southern hemisphere infinitely many often. You get a return map to this annulus, right? That's an example of the Birkhoff annulus. That's another example of global surface section. 
both, both these families of examples, oh, let's say both this example or this family of examples are examples of so-called integrable Hamiltonian systems. And the, the word integrable really means that uh, integrable, I guess, maybe a century ago, and I guess still today is used, used as a synonym, synonym, synonym of understood or understandable, which means we understand everything, right? We understand what's going on. So it's not so surprising, since we understand everything, it's not so exciting to find something which is supposed to help us understand everything. So it's backwards engineering. Not so exciting. Sorry? In the interior. It has to be transverse to the flow in the interior, because the boundary consists of periodic orbits, right? So it's not transverse. Okay, so the first, I guess, maybe one of the, not the oldest, but one of the oldest theorems about the existence of a global surface section for situations where you really consider in systems which are very, very far from being integrable is a theorem of Birkhoff. which is saying the following. So if you let me draw a picture. It's going to look a lot like that, but it's not to be thought of as a, the same picture. Let us consider every, uh, any uh, sphere equipped, two sphere, equipped with a metric with positive curvature, right? So let's say here, possibly curved sphere. Then you consider the, the geodesic flow. And then you, let's say you find a simple closed geodesic, which means a geodesic which doesn't self-intersect, like an embedded loop, like that. Okay, the, almost the same picture. And then you, you consider exactly the, exactly the same annulus. Choose a hemisphere, and on top of each point of this uh, global surface, of, of this geodesic, you put this bouquet of unit vectors pointing to one of the hemispheres. And then you have an annulus. Let's say this geodesic is A gamma. You have a, an annulus embedded in the unit sphere bundle. So the theorem of Birkhoff says that, let's say the, co the curvature is positive everywhere, and gamma is a simple closed geodesic. Then A gamma is a global surface section. So really, really talking about any possibly curved geodesic flow in S2. So this is a very, very large class of systems, very, very far from being integrable. So it's a, it's a quite uh, useful, st I mean, it's quite strong and useful statement, right? And in fact, you can prove a lot of stuff using this theorem. And, but the proof is not, the proof is too geometric to, to, to shed some light into the general problem of finding this. Okay. Strong statement by Birkhoff. So here's another strong statement, actually much more strong than this one. Maybe I should write it in bigger space. So every convex energy level inside, I mean, when I say convex, I really mean smooth, compact, strictly convex. Inside R4, 
with standard symplectic structure. If you don't know what a symplectic structure is, it doesn't really matter. I'm just talking about the standard Hamiltonian equations you write for a flow, right? So just some nice uh, strictly convex uh, hypersurface inside R4. And then you, you consider any Hamiltonian which realizes this, this uh, hypersurface as a regular energy level, anyone. So every such guy carries a disk-like global surface of section. So the situation is a, a bit like this one, right? You find an embedded disk, which is a global surface section. And here, the statement is saying that this is, not, this is not only true for this particular integrable system. This is true for every convex energy level. In particular, it, 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 it covers, I mean, uh, such energy levels, they double cover the geodesic flow here. So this theorem is somehow encoded there. Yeah, but uh, I, will, I will sweep the, the word dynamically inside the carp uh, below the carpet because I don't have time to explain. But yeah, there is a generalization of the notion of being convex in the symplectic dynamics world, and things get more complicated, but I'll, I'll stick to the simpler. Which means, I mean, there is no picture, right? Which just means that inside this three-dimensional space, which is just a copy of S3, you find this disk bounded by a, a periodic orbit, and then you have a return map. Right? So really, find these guys. For instance, as a corollary, you, you find two or infinitely many periodic orbits, because, because the return map, so the return map, see, if you take advantage of the fact that this, this is a Hamiltonian system, the return map will, will preserve a, a finite area form on this disk. So by, by Brouwer's uh, translation theorem, you find a fixed point. And then if you remove this fixed point, you end up with a map on an open annulus. By a very strong result of John Franks, if you find another periodic point, you'll find infinitely many periodic points. So it's really strong. Really strong statement. <coughs> All right. But I, I want to go back to the, to the origins of this notion. I mean, I want to, to really try to go back in history and find where exactly this, this idea was born. And it was born exactly from, from Poincaré's studies of the restricted three-body problem, where he was trying to do exactly the jump from studying differential equations from a very hard analytic point of view, trying to solve everything explicitly with pages and pages of power series. You know, he was trying to jump from this point of view to uh, a point of view where you study the dynamics qualitatively. I mean, you, you try to understand how the orbits behave and so on. So it really, it's really, he was really trying to find objects that would help him to understand the flow more qualitatively than trying to solve every, everything explicitly. So let me describe a bit the, the problem. So planner. Circular three body problem. So, the, the three body problem is just what you think it is. It's just uh, three masses moving according to, to Newton's law of gravitation, right? So, we have mass one, mass two, mass three, and then they attract each other.
according to Newton's law of gravitation. He wanted to study the dynamics of these uh, three bodies. So I have three adjectives that I have to explain. Planar, circular, and restricted. Planar means that, uh, that's what I mean. I mean, it just means what you think it is. As you, everything, the movement takes, takes, takes place into, in, in the plane. There is a plane where the movement takes place. All right. Restricted means the following. You sort of, right, let's say, let's say the positions here are Z1, Z2, and Z3. So how, does, how do the equations look like? Z1 dot dot equals to M2, Z2 minus Z1 plus M3, Z3 minus Z1, and so on, right? Finally, okay, something's wrong here. Uh, Z one minus Z two. Z3 minus 1, Z1, Z3. And 2, 3. OK. So restricted means the following. You, you see, the equation for the third body doesn't have m3. So you can, you know, you can, if you want, you can forget about put m3 equal to 0 here and here, where This means that the, the first two bodies are going to move as a solution of the two-body problem. And this follows whatever it, it follows, right? So the, the situation is that that's what restricted means. And circular now means the following, that if you have a, a two-body problem, then the relative position solves Kepler's problem. And then uh, you, the circular here means that follows a circular <coughs> solution. Okay. So these two guys are relatively moving as a circle, and this is f moving according to this equation, to this differential equation. Is this clear? Is, are there any questions about the three-body problem? So, so first thing you can do is you can put, so this should be thought of as something, some massless satellite, some massless particle, which doesn't influence the movement of these two particles. And then we can talk about the center of mass of these two particles. And you know, by, a, by, a, by a choosing an inertial coordinate system, we can put, the, put the, the, the center of mass, let's say a given point, say the origin. And then Z1 and Z2 are going to be moving around circles, moving as, a, a, in circles around this center of mass with the same angular speed. So you can consider a rotating frame where instead of seeing them moving like that, you, you make them st stay still. This is a known inertial cho choice of coordinates. So you, you're breaking, uh, you're not choosing a uh, system coordinates again, uh, which are inertial anymore. But anyway, you can do it. So let's say, let's put Z1 here, standing still. Z2 here, standing still. Th let's say the mass of Z2 is bigger, so the center of mass is a bit closer here, right? And then the satellite does something. And then it's moving somewhere, right? Let's say this is the x axis. This is the y axis. All right. And then it turns out, that, and that's a, a miracle now, that it turns out if you write down, if you really write down the equations for the relative position of the 
satellite respect to, to, the, to the heavier body, you're going to end up with a Hamiltonian system. You're going to end up with a Hamiltonian system. So how does it work? I don't have time to explain everything, but it's, it's going to be a Hamiltonian defined on an open set of R4, right? And it turns out that this Hamiltonian has uh, five critical, actually four critical levels, five critical points, and I, Poincaré was studying a situation below the lowest critical level. So below the lowest critical level, the sat if the satellite doesn't have too much energy to get to get closer to both primaries, both, um, let me call primaries these heavy guys. Satellite doesn't go close to this heavy guy or that heavy guy at the same time. I mean, he, they have to choose. So there are three so-called hill regions. They look like that. So one hill region is what's inside here. The other hill region is what's inside here. And the third hill region is what's outside here. One unb unbounded one. So satellite is moving here, or here, or outside, OK? All right. That's, so let's, say, let's say we are talking about our moon. Let's say that, that there is more mass here than here. Let's say we, we simplify the, the study of the movement of our moon as just considering the sun, the Earth, and the moon is a satellite, and nothing else Make this approximation. So this is Earth, this is sun, and the moon is here doing something, almost periodic. Of course, the moon also doesn't move in a plane, but it's almost the same plane, anyway. All right, but Poincaré was considered a situation here, near the heavy primary, and if, if, you, if, you, make the, if you make the limit, as all the mass is concentrated here, what's really happening is that you, you know, this hill region gets smaller and smaller, this point gets closer to the center of mass, this, con this is converting to a, to a certain disk. And then you see that uh, one can, so the Hamiltonian that you get is the so-called rotating Kepler problem. And uh, you can really find solutions, which are, he called, direct and retrograde. So there is a one periodic solution where the, 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 the satellite does this, and there is one periodic solution where the satellite does this. And that's already a, a bit of a insight from Poincaré from the point of view of qualitative studies because, you know, what, what he, how did he find the solutions? He, he considered the, the problem, which is not to be considered, but he considered the problem where all mass is, con is concentrated here. You study what's happening there. You find some periodic solutions. And then you try to continuate as you distribute a, bit, a little bit the mass here, right? So he was inventing the continuation method just to find these orbits. Already something special here. Not only he did this, but he found that you, know, you can regularize collisions with the heavy primary. And if you, if, you, if you regularize collisions with the heavy primary, what you get is that you lift the movement of the satellite here to an energy level inside R4. The nice compact energy level inside R4, and ins which is diffeomorphic to a three sphere, and inside there you see that these two orbits, they bound, they form a hop flink. They form a hop flink, and they're the boundary of an annulus, which is a global surface section. And because he found a global surface section, which is an annulus, Poincaré was able to think about what's nowadays called the Poincaré Birkhoff theorem. He wanted to study conditions on this return map on the annulus, which would allow him to find infinitely many periodic orbits. So in, in one stroke, he invented the continuation method. He used regularization. He, def he introduced the notion of global surface of section. He invented the poincare birkhoff theorem to find infinitely many periodic orbits of the three-body problem. And as we know, the, the poincare birkhoff theorem is just a, a special case of what's nowadays known as the, the Arnold conjectures. So that was the seed also of floor theory, symplectic field theory, things like uh, Augustine is going to talk about later. So, I mean, he really devastated a lot of stuff here just with one movement. So, the, qu the message I wanted to send is that Poincaré found this uh, annulus like global surface section. 
Okay, so let me just draw a picture. So it's what I mean. It's very hard to draw pictures. The energy level after regularization is going to be a three sphere again. So think about R three of some point very far away, and then you have this, these two orbits, the retrograde and the, and, the, and the direct ones, are forming this hop flink. And then you can try to picture an annulus which has a boundary in these guys, an embedded annulus. If you look at Chancinet's entry in Wikipedia, you find a very nice picture of these anodes. This is exactly the picture you get if you, if you consider Birkhoff's theorem, right? I mean, you, you, the, 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 unit, the unit sphere bound is RP3. Of course, the, it's doubly covered by S3. And then the, the two geodesics going, you have just one simple geodesic, but you can consider two periodic orbits, one going each way along the, the, the geodesic. If you take this link, if you go to the universal covering, which is S3, you find a, a hop link as well. Same thing. And the Birkhoff's annulus is isotopic to the annulus of Poincaré. All right. Now, sh sh is, there, is, is, is there anything? I mean, of course, I didn't explain a lot of stuff, right? I'm just talking about. Poincaré, and, but if there is anything that I should explain a bit more, if there is anything that I said which you know, is not so clear, please, please stop me. So I started 35 or 25? Uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. All right. Okay. So let me discuss. I mean, as you, as you know that, uh, I mean, you may or may not know that uh, celestial mechanics was in the turn of the century, from 19th century to 20th century, the, one of the, let's say, stronger sources of uh, insight for many things in mathematics. And until today, many problems from that, from that period are still open and they're still very hard to, to solve. One stupid problem, stupid between quotes, is the, the general existence problem of a, of a direct orbit, right? So even below, for energy levels, below the lowest critical value of, the, of this Hamiltonian. I mean, the Hamiltonian that you see here, I can write it down for you. I mean, I'm not going to write it down because I have to define all these variables. But uh, the Hamiltonian that you see here is certainly, it's, it's an unbounded from below and above. So what you see is that you go from below, you don't see any, you don't see any critical values. Even, eventually you pass, you pass a first critical value. It's exactly the moment where the satellite has a bit of energy and can go, from, can go near both primaries if, if, if given the right initial condition. Anyway. But you can consider this picture below the first critical value and you consider the, the situation where the satellite moves inside one of these two bounded regions, right? So there's, let's say this one. And, and if you don't insist in fixing that one of the primaries has more mass than the other, just consider any mass ratio, then it doesn't matter which one you look, right? The I mean. so, so let's consider any mass ratio. Any, any mass ratio between the primaries, and let's consider the, the movement of the satellite for this subcritical energy level inside one of the bounded hill regions. And, and so I if you consider the case of this sun, earth, moon, our moon, we would be talking about the sun very heavy here. Let's, yeah, the sun very heavy here. Let's say the earth here. And you see the moon, our moon here. And our moon is so-called direct. What does it mean? It means that it moves around the Earth in the same sense as the Earth moves around the Sun. That's what it means to be direct. 
And if, if, but there are also solutions which are retrograde, where, which means that the moon would do like that. I mean, it would move ag around the Earth in the opposite sense as the Earth moves against the, uh, around the sun. Some moons in the solar systems are direct, some are uh, retrograde. I don't know which ones, but I know there are. I know that our moon is direct, and, and still an open problem today to, to find a one uh, direct periodic orbit for arbitrary mass ratio. Poincaré found direct orbits near the heavy primary where when the, 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 the mass is almost all concentrated in the heavy primary. But if you want to, uh, to let uh, the, the mass uh, ratio be anything, it's still an open problem to find direct orbits. Finding retrograde orbits was already solved by Birkhoff. He invented the so-called Birkhoff shooting method, and he was able to find, so, I mean, if you want to find some, some orbit which does like this, you find just one simple circuit, no self-intersections, you find these orbits. Or here, any mass ratio, doesn't matter. So the strategy of Birkhoff to, to try to find, so why is, it, is it, why is it that there are, it's much easier to find re retrograde orbits? And then maybe this is a bit connected to what Augustine is going to talk about, is uh, th there, is a, there is a more, I mean, this is like a modern explanation. People knew that from a century ago. But uh, there is a, some kind of more theory for the action functional, whose critical points govern the, the periodic orbits. And the, the retrograde ones are the ones which are giving certain robust energy levels which capture the topology of the contact structure, whatever that means. And the retrograde ones, they can be very, 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 very long and, and very, very unstable, very, very high index properties. Direct. Huh? The, retro, the, direct. the direct, sorry, the direct. So if you think, for example, as, let's say, let's say you think of two uncoupled harmonic oscillators, but now we don't think of them as being harmonic oscillators with the same period, right? So there will be one periodic, so you have two periodic orbits. Let's say, let's say that the periods are un incommensurable, so they have only two periodic orbits. One periodic orbit is you freeze one oscillator, and the other is oscillating, and the other periodic orbit is do the, the opposite, right? You freeze one oscillator, and the other is, or this one, this is also, okay. One of these periodic orbits is going to be, have like, might, uh, it will have low action, and will have like nice index properties, um, but the other one will be very long and will have very bad index properties. And that refers to the difference between direct and retrograde here. So Birkhoff thought it would be a good idea to, to prove the following. Birkhoff thought that if you regularize, so you, you always find, he, he proved that you can always find a retrograde orbit. You can always find one. Let's say, let's say things are moving like that, so the retrograde looks like this. So if you lift this orbit, if you, do, if you do this regularization procedure, you end up with some flow on S3. And this orbit is going to be one of the components of this link. I mean, you don't know the link yet. But you find, let's say you find one of the components by regularizing and looking at what happens to the, to the retrograde orbit. So Birkhoff conjecture that it might be possible that the lift of the retrograde orbit we always bound a disk-like global surface section. He conjectured that. So if you, and then, if this is the case, you will find a fixed point of the return map by, apply, by applying Brouwer's translation theorem. And the fixed point could be a good candidate for the direct orbit. So this could be an, a strategy to find the direct orbit. Two very hard steps. First, find a global surface section. I mean, deciding whether these retrograde orbits are going to bound a global surface section or not. And then deciding if you find some fixed point which is going to be a direct orbit. So, so, but the conjecture was exactly this. Regularize collisions. Look at the lift of the retrograde orbit and try to prove that uh, it bounds a global surface section. That's Birkhoff's conjecture. So to today.
Anyway. I'm not sure if I'm going to go into any of my results in this talk. I'm just, I have some results on this problem, but it's very, very mild partial results, so I don't bother telling you about them. I mean, conjecture is wide open. I don't think there is anything that I know how to do that sheds any light on the, onto the general case. Uh, but I, I do want to tell you a bit about situations where you, I mean, it's very hard to decide whether you have global surfaces of section or not. There is a very general theory developed by in the second half of the 20th century, it started with uh, the work of Saul Schwarzman, of asymptotic cycles, David Fried, and then Danny Sullivan, it was all summarized recently by Etienne Gies. He called this Schwarzman Fried Sullivan theory. So there is a very general theory that tries to attack this problem of existence of global surface section in any flow in three dimensions. That's great. There is one drawback is that this is too much of, too hard of a problem. I mean, you end up with theorems which are, have very, very strong consequences, but also require very, very strong hypotheses, which are hard to check. But I don't want to go too much into detail. I just, I just want to say that in some situations, you do find uh, orbits, say, let's say one of these components, or let's say you find two, like you, you find the whole hop link. But it, it's hard to decide whether they bound the global surface section or not. And then, but still, it might be the case that the poincare bikov theorem, a, it's a theorem, it might be that the mechanism behind it is, is, is not, uh, let's say, purely coming from dynamical systems. It might be the case that there is some sort of Morse theory behind this. And it is the case, and sometimes you can find the periodic orbits you would find by looking at the global surface section, even in cases where you don't have a global surface section. Okay? So, I mean, you, you can try to picture Poincaré's annulus here, which is a bit harder, but you can also try to picture the falling annulus. Just remove this fixed point, right? And then you have this punctured disk, which is an annulus. It's an easier annulus to picture. Okay, so the last five minutes, I just want to. Um, describe a situation where you, you can find, uh, you, you can overcome the, the, the problem of deciding whether global surface sections are, exist or not and to ob obtain conclusions. So, so, so let's, say, let's say you have this, you have some energy level which is a copy of S3, and let's say for some reason, like m in many situations in celestial mechanics, you find the hop flink of periodic orbits. Let's say you find one. Then, if you have a periodic orbit or a flow, you can always do the following. You can consider the linearized dynamics transverse along the periodic orbit, transverse to the flow, right? Since that you have only two dimensions in the transverse of the orbit, basically you can cook up uh, diffeomorphism of the circle, right? Because you take a ray, look at linearized flow, and you see how much this ray rotated when you come back to the starting point at infinitesimal level. This is a circle diffeomorphism which has a, a, a rotation number. Let's call this number the transverse rotation number. Of course, to, to have it as a real number, you have to sort of trivialize the whole linearized dynamic along the orbit, which, has, which means you have to choose coordinates somehow, because the rotation number is only defined up to an integer anyway. But if you, if you look, let's say this guy here has rot transverse rotation number theta zero, and this guy here has transverse rotation number theta one. If you look at this annulus map, which in this case, let's say, it, let's say it extends to the boundary. Let's say you, you remove this point, you blow it up, right? You put an infinitesimal circle there. What you're going to be seeing here is a the rotation number in this boundary component with the annulus is going to be theta one, let's say that way. And the rotation number here in this boundary component is, is going to be one over theta zero, just because this is a transverse rotation number, so you want to return to the, to the disk, there is a one over factor. One over is inverse. Okay, 
So the, by the Poincaré Bickel theorem, if uh, let's say theta one different than one over theta zero, you have infinitely many periodic points, or and periodic points means really infinitely many periodic orbits of the flow. Okay. Let, let's say there is one. Let's pretend. Oh, okay. Let's pretend there is one. Then you would, you would find an annulus. And, and it's not hard to check that these would be the rotation numbers on these boundary components. But now, so this, this, this so we pretend that, that, that there was a disk here, global surface section. What happens if, if, if there is no global surface section? So you might want to try to prove a theorem where this condition, which makes sense, even if there is no disk like global surface section, would imply the existence of infinitely many periodic points. That would be good to prove this, right? So this is exactly one theorem that, uh, OK, maybe I, I state a result. Which means, it, so let me state it like that. If you have in R4, if you have a star-shaped energy level, let's say star-shaped with respect to the origin, so it's a diffeomorphic to S3, some nice energy level. Let's say inside this energy level, you find a hop link of periodic orbits, right? And let's say, let's say, so gamma one, gamma one, zero gamma gamma one, inside energy level, forming. So periodic orbits. Forming a hop link. So, so, but you don't have a disk. You don't have a disk like global surface section. But you can look at their transverse rotation numbers. So the situation basically says, so the, the theorem basically says that there is a slightly fancier way of doing this, which is the following. Uh, so consider vector looking like, uh, let's say, let's say in the plane here, let's say the vector, this vector here is, is theta zero, one, and this vector here is one theta one. Right? So this is a vector with second coordinate equal to one. This is a vector with first coordinate equal to one. So if these guys are not collinear, which in that case means exactly that. Uh, so you find a, an open wedge here, which you will, will contain infinitely many points of the integer lattice. Right? Each point in the integer lattice let's say P and Q, the theorem says it will, it will correspond to a periodic orbit which links P times with, with theta gamma zero and Q times with theta one, which would be exactly the, the orbits would, you, you would find from applying poincare bickel theorem to this annulus map. That's the statement of the theorem, which means that you don't have, in this situation, don't have to get the global surface section. You get something just from the flow. And then one corollary, is, well, half of a corollary is, is, is this, this statement provides half of a new proof of the existence of infinitely many periodic uh, ge closed geodesics on a Riemannian two-sphere. I know my time is. Up. So I have this theorem celebrated by, theorem by John Franks and Victor. Bangert. Every Riemannian geodesic flow on S2 carries infinitely many periodic uh, closed geodesics.
So there is a way to prove this using this theorem plus a lot of stuff from Nancy Hingston. So Hingston plus our theorem implies a theorem. So there is a new proof. Let me just finish by describing this proof in, in, in one minute. So the, the space of embedded loops in, in, in S2 carries a three-dimensional homology class. Let's say embedded loops in S2 modulo short ones. This guy carries a three-dimensional homology class, which is just like that. For every, for every pair of antipodal points in S2, you have this family of long, short loops, right? So for every point, of, every point in RP2, you have this one-dimensional, but you have another RP2 parameter. So you have three-dimensional homology class. So there is a, a, there is a, there is a curve shortening flow from Grayson's work in the 80s, saying that you can flow down, you can shorten, there is a flow that will shorten these loops, right? And it, it will preserve the property of being embedded. So you have this three-dimensional class, modulo short ones, start flowing down. This will, because it's a non-trivial homology class, this will cook up a special closed geodesic, which is going to be simple. That's one important step. The key point is that, so this is a three-dimensional class. This means that the Morse index plus the nullity of this closed geodesic is going to be bigger or equal than three. Okay? So, these are, so as I said before, a simple closed geodesic on S2 gives you two periodic orbits on the unit sphere bundle, right? The geodesic going in both directions. So let's lift everything to S3. This is going to lift to a hop link, right? And there are two possibilities. Either these vectors coincide or not. So in the case they coincide, they form a very special critical point of the energy functional. And there is a very, very deep theorem by uh, Nancy Hingston that is saying that in this case, there will be infinitely many periodic orbits. That case we cannot handle. But if they don't coincide, then this theorem handles this case. And then uh, that's, that would be the steps of this uh, new proof of this theorem. Okay, so, sorry for the extra time. I'll stop here.